Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Urban. I'm the Education Specialist here at the Roosevelt Presidential Library. Welcome to this session titled uh, Reconsidering Representations of the Holocaust, Digital Curation, Evidence and Remembrance Through the Visual History of the Holocaust, VHH Project. This is part of our 2021 virtual conference, Examining American Responses to the Holocaust, uh, Digital Possibilities, hosted by the Roosevelt Institute and the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. This session is being recorded and will be posted later on the FDR uh, Library's uh, YouTube channel. Only registered attendees are able to participate in discussions. So uh, res reg registrants, uh, please type your questions into the Q&A tab so that our moderator can pose them to the panelists uh, throughout the uh, presentation. The code of conduct for this conference is simple. Dialogue must be civil, respectful, and focused on Holocaust studies and digital humanities. Personal attacks, profanity, or hate speech will not be tolerated and violators will be blocked. Any links or content not directly related to the conference will be removed. Our session uh, moderator today is Sema Copeland, and she is the historian and research coordinator at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Digital History. So I will turn it over to her to begin our program. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, sorry. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as Jeffrey just said, um, part of the <clears throat> Ludwig Boltzmann team uh, at this panel, and I'm also part of the management office um, of the VHH project, which will be at the heart of our panel and discussion today. Um, so VHH stands for uh, Visual History of the Holocaust, rethinking curation in the digital age <clears throat> and i will try to co-moderate this session with jeff and i'd like to start by introducing um just the agenda for today um hang on so the first presentation is uh going to be by tobias ebrecht hartmann tobias is a lecturer for film and german studies at the department of communication and journalism and uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Today he will talk about how historic images uh, migrate into mass media and how the visual history of the Holocaust can be accessed through popular culture. After him, uh, Lindsay Sarbel takes over and talks about archive films and other types of documents that bear witness to the liberation of Nazi concentration and extermination camps by the US Army. Uh, Lindsay is a film artist at the United States Holocaust Museum. Uh, we need so, to mute the microphone. Is that right? There are some noises. That? Seems to be good now. Okay. Um, sorry, go on. <laughs> um, Yes, after Lindsay, um, Ingrid Sechner uh, is, is going to talk to us. Uh, Ingrid is head of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Digital History here in Vienna, as I said, and he's also the coordinator of the so-called VHH project. And his first contribution deals with digital tools used in the project, especially the media management and search infrastructure of the project. Um, then the fourth presentation will be by Chris Austin. Chris is preservation specialist at NARA, and she will be talking to us about uh, digitizing, digitizing archival film footage. And um, yeah, her presentation is called Unfolding the Visual History of the Holocaust Through American Liberation Footage, Digitizing Nearest Evidential Moving Images. And after Chris, Ingo um, will take the floor again to present the automated analysis tools uh, that are being deployed uh, in the project. And then um, the director of the Austrian Film Museum, uh, Michael Löwenstein, will talk about important research questions and the objectives of the project itself. Um, at the end, uh, if you still need me, I might just say a few words about the project's framework in general. Um, 
Um, so yeah, after that, after that, we can jump into the discussion and I suggest that um, the audience might either um, type their questions into the Q&A um, part of the platform or raise their hands. I think we can try to uh, do either way and I will just um, ask them to unmute us um, as it fits. Um, I guess. And so, yeah, generally also please um, note that the presentations include uh, graphic images that might, may, may be disturbing or upsetting. So um, please take care as you watch. So um, I'll hand over to Tobias. I'm blind here because you can either see his presentation or the screen. So I'm, my role is to tell Tobias if we can't hear him that his microphone is off. Okay, can you hear me now? I didn't. Talk yes, yet. we can. Yeah. And you can't see my 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 presentation. We can see your presentation. All good. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to participate at this conference and to um, contribute to this presentation of the research we are doing in the visual history of the Holocaust Rethinking Curation in the Digital Age project. Um, my part is to introduce actually uh, and kind of prepare the floor for the insight into our project and the different way how we are processing historical footage and um, um, uh, creating a repository which uh, then serves for new forms of digital curation and historical research. And um, for doing so, I would like to take you on uh, a journey um, which will follow the path of visual memory. Um, the idea is that we start um, by exploring um, the popular representations of Holocaust memory uh, and um, in order to understand how this visual memory is shaped by the historical visual evidence of the events. Uh, so let's just begin by um, looking at this cinematic representation of uh, memory in the film Shutter Island by Martin Scorsese. got through the gates at dark and the SS guard surrendered. Carmen Dodd tried to kill himself before we got there, but <laughs> um, sorry. Tobias, we can't see your presentation. You can't hear? Oh. Uh, we are but we are seeing it? and he, we are seeing and hearing it on okay. this end. Okay, I'm happy. So hopefully it's uh, it's just you, Sema. Um, okay, so I hope everyone was able to um, to listen to the dialogue. So you saw Leonardo DiCaprio remembering events from the Second World War when he served as uh, when his character served as a soldier in the U.S. Army, liberating the um, concentration camp Dachau near Munich. And what we actually see in this kind of flashbacks are quite iconic situations, quite, quite iconic visualizations of um, that moment of liberation. Um, but what is interesting and maybe also confusing is that we have actually two historical places blending into each other. Uh, we know that the soldiers are approaching Dachau concentration camp, but we see actually the gate uh, of the infamous Auschwitz um, um, uh, concentration and annihilation camp. What is um, an interesting form of uh, a mimetic transmediation of historical footage, like the, 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 uh, the representation of the Auschwitz gate, um, into a slightly different context. And here we see already how the visual memory of 
but Holocaust and also of liberation is based on a certain set of iconic images. And when we follow this scene, we see that this form of transmediation also happens in the other flashbacks um, uh, of the main character. Uh, we see them approaching the camp in between the fences, which is immediately referring to um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the depictions of Soviet cameramen of children walking in between fences in the liberated Auschwitz um, concentration camp, a form of elusive transmediation, which is not a direct mimetic form of representing historical events or of kind of mimicking the historical footage, but um, to create um, uh, uh, an analogy which activates memories, the visual memories of the viewers. And um, the last scene in a similar way uh, refers to Auschwitz liberation footage, but again in a form of mimetic transmediation by very closely kind of re restaging the historical footage and even imitating the panning shot along the prisoners, which we know from the Auschwitz liberation footage, and thereby also in including certain iconic images and iconization into the sequence, which immediately makes the audience understanding, yes, what we are seeing here is um, a, a reference to the history of the Holocaust, to the period of liberation in a film that is only in passing relating to that specific um, history. So let's see a second recalling of those events of liberation in Charter Island. When we were outside, I saw the bodies on the ground. I need a count. This is a crucial scene in the movie and also in its quite complex composition of memory, forgetting, recalling, trauma, suppression. Um, and of course, especially because two events are overlaying here or connecting with each other, the discovery of the crimes of the, of the Holocaust and, um, uh, and the reactions here of the US Army also based on historical um, uh, facts. Um, and the uh, uh, kind of impulsive killing of, um, of uh, guards and other Germans that they found in the camp. What is interesting, um, what, uh, in order to closely analyze how this happens, is that it's actually visual compositions and a certain form of a resonant transmediation of historical footage that connects both of these um, dimensions we see that the, um, that the scenes of the shooting resemble also through the panning shot, um, the panning along the fence where we see the liberated prisoners in the scenes before. So this, um, thereby we see that through certain um, cinematic movements and compositions, uh, these kind of relations are established. And um, I want to um, focus uh, your attention now to one specific composition in this scene, which is very important because it has a, a quite symbolic um, um, uh, meaning. And we see here in this scene, the transformation of historical image uh, or historical um, uh, footage taken by 
US um, Signal Corps members at uh, Dachau from this famous death train. Um, but we see here that it's clearly visually trans transformed um, and, and uh, uh, in order to, to, to emphasize this um, symbolic meaning of the frozen bodies and uh, also the frozen memories that are so activated here in this film. So while Shutter Island is so to say referring to the historical um, uh, events in, by, by, um, by um, transmediating this footage uh, in, in a mimetic or uh, um, uh, elusive way, we see in the liberator a form of contextualization of this um, historical events by focusing in this miniseries on the actual um, uh, troops that uh, finally liberated Dachau. We see in this scene that the encounter with the death train, um, uh, which was um, documented in the footage taken by American cameraman um, uh, at Dachau, um, became, so to say, the symbolic moment of encountering the Holocaust from an American perspective. And although the film then also progresses to um, uh, uh, the atrocities committed by American soldiers, we see here really this this very um, uh, detached and um, um, emphasis, uh, emphatic moment of discovering um, the atrocities. And if we look closely, we see that actually the film in its, in its mimetic way of reenacting the historical events in an animated movie is actually referring to two iconic moments, uh, which we know from that footage um, uh, uh, by kind of transposing the situation of a cameraman looking into one of the wagons to, uh, to kind of look uh, to, to looking at the back of the commander and then switching to the historical um, uh, photograph, which is again also transposed by focusing on a specific uh, extract. So here we have um, kind of two contradictory movements in the way how the footage is used. On the one hand, we see um, a form of contextualization by referring to um, uh, George Stevens, um, who was um, uh, commanding the Signal Corps unit, who had his um, uh, private 60 millimeter camera with him and was also documenting what he saw in, um, in Dachau next to the, uh, to the official documentation um, of his team. And on the other hand, um, we clearly see how um, Godard tr tr tries to, um, to turn the historical footage into a metonymic image, which creates a new relation with a much general and much universal visual history of atrocities and visual history of, um, of violence by interconnecting very clearly um, a specific the transposed part of a uh, painting by um, Goya uh, that would then in this particular kind of close up cropped version resemble the footage um, uh, from Dachau, which in itself is visually transposed and thereby um, kind of reappropriated in a different way and kind of detached from the historical context, as you see here. Um, an additional layer of coloring is added to it and it is superimposed then with uh, footage from uh, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, which creates this moment of 
um, kind of shifting between a contextualization on the one hand and decontextualization on the other hand by indicating the historical context of the footage and then using it in a much more detached symbolic way, which also becomes clear when Godard refers to Ravensbrück and Auschwitz, um, but not uh, to Dachau, where actually Stevens took this uh, footage. So I hope I was able to, um, to show you how this, uh, these different representations um, create relations and references to the historical footage, which in itself even then creates interesting uh, resonances. And um, uh, please, help, please follow now uh, the path towards a further kind of contextualization and historization of this um, uh, visual memory of the Holocaust. Thank you very much. Okay, hi everyone, good morning. I'm uh, Lindsay, I'm gonna follow up Tobias here. Just give me a second to get my uh, presentation up. Okay, I think you all can see that slide. Um, I'm Lindsay Zarwell, the film archivist at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I'm really delighted to join uh, the panel this morning to discuss why it's critical for archivists to have the kind of digital tool under development in this VHH project um, as a way to annotate filmic content, its format and subjects, the makers behind the lens, related materials, and reuse or fictional representations in the post-war years. So I'm going to take you deeper into the vaults this morning, um, exploring different collections documenting uh, the one site that Tobias referenced, that is the rail cars uncovered by American soldiers outside uh, the Dachau concentration camp. So just as a reminder, um, uh, my presentation includes graphic images um, that can be disturbing or upsetting, and I really urge you to take care as you watch. So American forces liberated da the Dachau concentration camp on April 29th, 1945, and found more than 30 abandoned open rail cars filled with prisoners who had been evacuated from Buchenwald in the last days of the war. Bodies were in an advanced state of decomp decomposition. Here, the United States Army's special coverage film unit, known as SPICU, headed by film director George Stevens, captured the horrific scene on color film. Working under the auspices of the Army Pictorial Office, the 45 men of SPICU, that is experienced camera and sound operators, directors, and writers, were issued handheld cameras with color and black and white film and tasked with documenting key wartime events on the Allied European Front from 1943 to 1946. Their work forms a, quote, essential visual record of World War II, as the Librarian of Congress announced in 2008 when the footage was entered into the United States National Film Registry. However, the gruesome site of the death train wasn't only filmed by Spiku. Some American soldiers carried their own personal movie cameras with them into the concentration camp, recording nearly identical frames with lingering shots of corpses. For example, here you see frames from Colonel Wilbur Dockham of the 692nd Field Artillery Battalion, Major Sid Sidney Burr of the 388th Bombardment Group of the 8th Air Force, and Colonel Alexander Zabin, a medical doctor with the 4th Auxiliary Surgical Group. Now, in moving image, you see Dockham's film at the left and Burr's film at the right. One of the cameramen with the special coverage unit, Philip Drell, wrote a letter home on May 15, 1945. In his words, quote, about 200 yards out, we crossed some railroad tracks. 
turned left and drove along them for a short while until we realized a freight train. It's hard to describe your feelings when you, when you run into what was on this train. The infantry was coming by and it's rare that they give vent to their feelings or rarer yet, encourage the photographer and try to help him and tell him to be careful and photograph everything. The train was loaded with human beings. Once they were Poles, Russians, French, Italians, and all other peoples of Europe and Jews. They were all dead, loaded into open box cars, sent across Europe with no protection against the weather, with no food, with no water. The bodies were bones. The clothes, if any, were a few rags. Maybe photographs can show some of this, but they'll never convey the actual horror and smell and scent of this scene. We turned up the road, reached the road sign which said concentrations lager, followed it, and reached the barbed and electrified fence of Dachau concentration camp, the worst we were yet to see." End quote. First-hand film evidence of Nazi atrocities shocks the viewer, as it did the cameramen, whether they were professionals or amateurs. The VHH project allows us to go deeper, providing today's researchers with unfiltered access to the layers within archival source material. Think about how this letter from Philip Drell, the cameraman, photographs of Spiku crew members or caption sheets expand the meaning of the iconic and symbolic frames uh, of the Dachau train footage. So what's perhaps not obvious uh, with this example is that all of the films and the related materials, which exist in both analog formats and digitized versions, are dispersed across repositories in the United States and abroad. The color film reels uh, taken by George Stevens and his Spiku crew are preserved by the Library of Congress and are located in Culpeper, Virginia. Um, the caption sheets on the left here and the narratives by the cameramen and writers are at the Margaret Herrick Library uh, of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Beverly Hills, California. The black and white film coverage by Philip Drell is part of the United States Army Signal Corps Record Group 11180C at the National Archives, which Chris uh, will be discussing in just a few minutes. Personal collections by crew members uh, with letters and photographs, as well as oral testimonies, are located at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and other domestic archives. And uh, post-war, immediately post-war produced films containing Spiku shots uh, with added narration, like, uh, like the film Death Mills or Nazi concentration camps, which was presented as film evidence at the Nuremberg trials, um, are located even further away at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. So the new VHH tools will really allow us to properly track and expand upon interconnected archival films like these and encourage critical thinking of primary source materials. So thanks so much. I'll now turn it over to Ingo um, to give you an overview of the VHH MMSI, which is the technical platform under development uh, with this project. I will also share my screen. So please let me know if you can see the first slide because I cannot see you any longer. Hmm. Yes, yeah. we can. Yes, okay. it works. Great. Thanks. So good morning, everybody. My name is Ingo Zechner. I'm a philosopher and historian, the director of the Austrian uh, of the, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Digital History in Vienna, Austria, and uh, the coordinator, as Sima already said, of the Visual History of the Holocaust Project. I will start with a fragment of a clip that we already saw in uh, Tobias Ebrecht Hartmann's presentation. And I think we should watch this highly complex sequence a second time. Let's uh, watch the footage uh, Jean-Luc Godard refers to, and you already saw part of it, parts of it in uh, Lindsay's presentation. I will remain silent for the next 36 seconds, but it might be the case that uh, the playback is choppy again. It seems that the platform does not uh, handle uh, HD video very well. So please let me know if you, if you experience any 
problems. So what's wrong about uh, the voiceover of Jean-Luc Godard in his Histoire du Cinéma? First, uh, Auschwitz was, not, was liberated in 1945 and not in 1944. George Stevens was uh, neither at Auschwitz nor at Ravensbrück. No American cameraman took any pictures at Auschwitz upon liberation. It was the Soviet Red Army who liberated Auschwitz in January 1945 until two weeks before the US Army had suffered heavy, heavy losses at the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes counteroffensive at Belgium and Lux Luxembourg, they were far away from uh, any concentration camps. Uh, George Stevens also was not the first to use 16 millimeter color film at liberated concentration camps. It was the US Army Air Forces in their special film project number 18, who most likely also were the ones to supply George Stevens with the 60 millimeter Kodachrome film stock. And finally, it was not George Stevens himself who took the pictures, but a lesser known cameraman under his supervision, whom we may identify by studying the clapboards in the footage or uh, accompanying documentation. So when and where did this key moment of uh, as Godard says, resurrection of documentary cinema, cinema actually take place. It took place, as Tobias already mentioned, at Dachau at the beginning of May 1945. On the right side, we see what the body of the cameraman is covering. The bodies in the open door of the railroad car. This is a still from Death Mills, a short so-called orientation film, which is famous for Billy Wilder's involvement in the production. This film was screened in German and Austrian cinemas in 1946 and is the most widely watched re-education film. Lindsay already mentioned it briefly in her presentation. So is this what the cameraman saw when he was uh, taking his pictures? It uh, definitely is, but uh, we would not be able to tell from the two slides, but we can from the moving images that we saw before. Is this one of the pictures the cameraman took? Uh, most likely not, because he's standing closer to the door than the viewpoint of the cameraman in the other picture. Was the picture taken by the other cameraman standing behind him and capturing him on film why he took his pictures. It could have been the case, but most likely uh, this was not so, because the pictures taken from behind are, as you can see, in color, while uh, the picture in Death Mills, the pictures in Death Mills are in black and white. So uh, where does this picture come from? NARA holds copies of the official black and white footage taken by the US Army Signal Corps, as uh, Lindsay already mentioned. Number 4471 4, of the so-called army depository copies, the ADC copies, contains the sequence to the left. This is clearly the same scene, but it is not the source of the picture in Death Mills. It is also closer to the door. It seems that the source of the picture is ADC 4472, which you now see to the left. However, we cannot tell for sure as the image in this early video transfer of the footage is cropped and we do not see the full picture. We will be able to tell after redigitization and uh, after close inspection. For this close inspection, we of course want to know 
everything we can about the footage. Any accompanying documentation might help. For example, this uh, shot list card, which has been preserved and digitized at NARA. The original caption sheet might also help, but we don't know if it exists. It's typical that these kinds of accompanying documents and other related materials are, as Lindsay already mentioned, stored in different departments of archives or even in different archives. Digitization allows for bringing them together and for linking them to each other. The first aim of uh, the visual history of the Holocaust project uh, are to digitize and aggregate relevant materials to allow uh, provides uh, uh, to allow pro to provide the basis for research questions such as the example of Jean-Luc Godard's reuse of George Stevens' footage. This aggregation is done in the VHH MMSI, the Visual History of the Holocaust, Media Management and Search Infrastructure. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Photo Archives kindly shared some 8,500 relevant digitized photographs and accompanying metadata with the VHH project. A search for Dachau Death Train currently delivers 78 results of photographs. In the VHH project, it is, uh, it is our understanding of advanced digitization that digital objects are twofold. They consist of both data and metadata. The VHH MMSI, the VHH MMSI therefore aims to aggregate both data and metadata. The data model of the VHH MMSI is designed to answer four main questions. From which analog object was the digitized object generated? From which other analog or digital instances are there and how do they differ? How do the objects relate to each other? Where does uh, all the other information come from? That's why we move from the concrete digital media item in our collection to the manifestation of which it is a copy and further to other manifestations in other analog and digital formats. That's also why we're interested in all manifestations of a creation and in their common properties and in their differences. Comparing individual different manifestation of a creation to each other, comparing objects to other objects, comparing individual objects to groups of objects is a core functionality. Its technical implementation in the VHH project is the split screen, which is therefore also a core feature of the VHH MMSI. The split screen not only allows to compare different information levels of objects and different objects, but also to relate objects to other entities, such as a photograph to the photographer or generally speaking, a creation to its creator. To the right uh, is uh, uh, the VHH MMSI entry of David Edward Line, who served as a photographer at the US Army Signal Corps and took the picture that you just saw before on the left side. Another example is the relation between an object and uh, the place of its creation. However, uh, aggregating digital data and metadata from objects that have not yet or only been partially digitized requires a digitization strategy that is uh, very challenging and when it comes, especially when it comes to analog film. How we try to meet these challenges, this is what Chris Austin will now talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Ingo. I'm gonna bring up my presentation here. Hopefully everyone can see that now. All right, uh, as Ingo mentioned, I'm Chris Austin and I'm the supervisor of the Motion Picture Preservation Lab at NARA. Our lab is responsible for photochemical preservation along with digitization for preservation and access. And we're fortunate to be a partner for the VHH project as this gave us the opportunity to provide essential content and enrich the MMSI platform with evidential imagery. As mentioned, the project isn't only about the images of the Holocaust, but considers how the images are, were, and will be presented. In addition to tracing the threads of how the footage has been used, the project also takes into consideration the history of the film carrier itself, as the physical characteristics add contextualization around the images as well. 
The example of the death train at Dachau is a perfect example of how tracking the use and reuse of a film through its physical characteristics is an important part of the project. As mentioned by Ingo, in Nera's holdings, the footage appears in its raw black and white state from the Army Signal Corps and in the orientation film series documentary, Death Mills, developed to educate the German population. While the initial plan was for Nera to scan all of our related holdings in-house, the pandemic forced us into a two-pronged approach where half the reels are being scanned at the Austrian Film Museum. As the reels are scanned, both institutions capture the visual history of the film frame by frame. The image is overscanned to include the soundtrack area and edge code information that is particular to that reel. For example, the image on the left shows us that the soundtrack was recorded as a variable area soundtrack rather than another type of track. We can see that a previous copy was developed poorly due to the streaking coming from the top of the patrolling soldiers and we can see that the emulsion sustained damage resulting in voids in the emulsion and cracking. The grainy image also indicates that this scene has been reprinted multiple times. In the image on the right, along the right side of the frame, we can tell that this copy is three generations removed from the original exposed in the camera by looking at the printed through perforations surrounding the black perforation hole of this copy. The information on the far right side shows that this copy was printed on Kodak film stock indicated by the light blue KO along the edge, which overlies the white edge numbers of 169. This might be a bit hard to follow, but what it boils down to is that much like genetic information is passed down through generations, historical information is passed down through successive copies of the film. So we are able to make some inferences about the characteristics of the original source. I would also like to add that while the image of the soundtrack is included in the overscan, we also scan the track separately to deliver as a WAV file. This file is unaltered in any way to provide an accurate audio representation of how the track appears on the film, including any defects. The second way that information about the source is captured is through embedding metadata into each file. During the inspection process to prepare the films for scanning, a preservationist completes a full inspection report, and then this information is embedded into the DPX files, along with information about where the film was scanned, the scanning equipment, and parameters. The tool we use is an open source application developed by FAGI, an AV preserve called Embark. Additional information includes the unique identifier for each reel, source creation date, the type of film stock, condition of the reel, data on the capture process, and data on the storage aspects for the file. After the scans are completed at NARA, we retain mezzanine level HD AVI files 50 megabit MP4 files, and we deliver two megabit MP4 files for upload into the catalog and for on-site research. The DPX and WAV files and MP4s are provided to the Austrian Film Museum for reference and MMSI tool development. If you're interested in the technical parameters, I would encourage you to visit the VHH website to review the advanced digitization toolkit deliverables. As you've seen in Lindsay's presentation, the image on the slide is from the 16 millimeter color footage shot by George Stevens unit of the death train at Dachau. As the footage and the related materials are spread across multiple institutions, it is imperative that we track where each source was shot originally, where it resides, and where related footage is held. It is our goal that the technical parameters of this project also support this mission. And for more information, I will turn it back over to Ingo. Share my screen again. So this conference is about digital possibilities, and uh, it uh, uh, even after finishing a complex process like the one described uh, by Chris in her presentation, digitization does not end uh, by creating a digital copy 
of an object. What we are interested in is in, the, in addition to collecting metadata that's already available in archives to generate our own metadata from the digitized objects. And uh, we are doing this both with films and with text documents. We are doing this together with one of our project partners, the Technical University Vienna. And uh, the slides uh, that I'm showing to you were actually created uh, by them, by our colleagues, uh, Daniel Helm and uh, Sebastian Hofstetter. So um, for film analysis, uh, they created in course of the project, uh, a film analysis pipeline that includes uh, various modules that can be uh, yeah, uh, used separately or in combination with each other. What we are interested in to do is overscan detection. Um, and Chris already mentioned that uh, we are trying to cover the full area of, 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 of an image uh, to uh, make sure that any information uh, the film contains will also be uh, transferred to the digital copy and uh, yeah, uh, in case the film is lost, uh, the original copy is lost, the analog copy is lost, the digital image will still contain all uh, relevant information. It, it also allows for inspection uh, of uh, the, uh, the digital films. Uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, sometimes uh, even heads of persons, other elements may not be visible if uh, the image is cropped. So, uh, what the overscan detection does is to uh, detect the, the area of, uh, of, the, the, uh, of, the, of the image uh, and uh, to allow us to either mask or unmask uh, the, the overscanned parts of the, of the image. What we're doing is also uh, an automated detection of some basic cinematographic settings, like for example, shot boundary detection. So the beginning, the first frame and the end of uh, every shot or uh, the uh, automatic detection of uh, camera movements like pans uh, and tilts and also shots type classification. So the identification if uh, a shot is uh, a close up, a long shot, uh, a medium shot or anything else. Um, object detection is uh, part of a, a low level uh, semantic uh, analysis of films. And uh, here we are mainly interested in uh, yeah, uh, identifying uh, objects of any kind and objects is a very broad term used uh, in a technical way. It also includes uh, persons, so uh, people. And uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, films uh, like the ones we're dealing with contain a lot of people. So imagine you would have to identify every single person. Uh, this would uh, make uh, uh, manual annotation very, uh, yeah, very extensive. But what we are mainly interested in is at an early stage of development, uh, it's what we call relation detection. And uh, that's first of all, uh, yeah, a tool that should help us identify the use and reuse from archival images, from footage uh, in documentary films, uh, in re-education films and in others. So to ad identify the identical frame when it has been used or reused in other films, but also on a second level in identifying similar images from other films. Uh, yeah, uh, remember the slides that Lindsay showed to you with uh, the different uh, um, soldiers holding their private cameras and capturing the same scene. That's exactly what this tool is aiming for, to find similar scenes in different movies, uh, but also uh, images like the popular culture images that uh, Tobias showed to you uh, to uh, identify uh, yeah, uh, the inspiration of films, uh, also uh, fictional films, by uh, archival footage. And uh, the platform includes uh, a video player, or as we prefer to call a film player, that allows us to access uh, these uh, automatically created annotations and uh, to edit them. That's an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, curation from our point of view that we uh, yeah, don't just go with what the uh, automatic tools deliver. Uh, there is, as uh, it was also called in a project, a human in the loop that can edit information and uh, we are looking for ways to display um, automated uh, information next to um, manually created information and supervised information by experts. 
uh, another glimpse at the video player. So the first is the editing tool. This is the displaying tool, and uh, it allows for uh, full access to all parts of the films uh, and uh, all, uh, on a shot based and on a frame based level with the information uh, directly attached uh, to the to the shots and even to the individual frames or groups of frames. We're trying to do similar things with text documents, uh, like, uh, for example, the shot list cards that you saw, or uh, the caption sheets, uh, letters, reports, or other things uh, that are first uh, document or, or photographed at archives, and uh, also their text documents, they're turned into just uh, images, but uh, have to be processed uh, with OCR software uh, to make them readable, machine readable, at least uh, again. And that's what's happening with a Bo, uh, an OCR software pipeline created uh, by uh, the project that allows uh, to upload so documents of various kinds uh, in various languages and uh, um, generates uh, an, uh, yeah, a machine readable text format that can also be edited both by artificial intelligence or with the help of artificial intelligence and uh, by human operators who may choose um, yeah, uh, mis uh, alternative terms when terms are misspelled uh, from suggestions made to them or even type in their own correct uh, uh, transcript. And uh, going one step further, we are creating uh, tools to search these kind of uh, transformed OCR ads documents uh, in a new manner by uh, first uh, searching, for example, for the exact term. That's what's usually happening if there's a full text search, but also searching for synonyms. That's also a very classical approach, uh, synonyms expanding also to um, uh, other languages. So this includes an aspect of multilingualism. Uh, but uh, we go one step further by uh, also employing and uh, uh, training mainly uh, network tools, neural network tools that will allow us uh, on a graph based level to use uh, search queries and uh, find similar terms that are usually used next to other terms. So here the idea is like with relation detection to be able to find things that human operators wouldn't even look for and to detect similarities with the help of technology. So thank you and I will now hand over to Michael. Thank you very much Ingo and I'm gonna finally also share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Look, um, as, as you would have figured from, from our presentations, we didn't go in a chronological order in terms of moving from the objectives and the general research questions of a project then um, to the present day, but we rather chose to turn it around this time and to start with contemporary um, manifestations of Holocaust remembrance in film of an iconography of destruction, if you um, if you so will, that still pervades our thinking and our visual our idea of what a visual history of the Holocaust looks like. And after a tour now through the um, original footage through the archival situation, particularly pertaining to the um, U.S. filmic response to the Holocaust and to um, the architecture of our digital platform that is going to uh, make these images accessible and that is going to en enable research and a transformative use of these images. Let me just for a couple of minutes um, go back to the objectives of the project and to our initial um, research questions. Before diving into those research questions, just a bit of um, cultural background and policy background to our visual history of the Holocaust project. This um, is actually a European uh, Union funded research project that responded to a call called uh, DT transformations, curation of digital assets and advanced digitization. And the original call, the original background to that call for proposals was that um, proposals should address the curation and preservation of digital assets. They should, and I'm quoting from the original call, provide new technologies and methods that enable richer experiences, storytelling, and the linking of physically separated objects and sites 
tangible and intangible heritage. So very obviously, um, this project um, and the call that enabled this project responds to many of the questions that are at the core of this FDR library uh, conference here. So it is the digital possibilities, so how digitization can enable actually looking at historical events and transform cultural heritage, but also responding to certain issues that digitization might solve or that digitization can actually create. So why? Um, background digitization in the eyes of policymakers, and I would generally agree, still focuses mainly on capturing the visual appearance of objects, collection or sites. Um, we try to break that open by what um, Chris referred to and Inge referred to as advanced digitization. It is, it is also often centralized and static with experts performing digitization and archiving and with the digital cultural resources rarely updated and consolidated. And I think this is an issue that all of us know. So what are the research objectives then of um, the VHH project? Just to quickly walk you through those. How do moving images shape our visual memory of the past? How do these images migrate through time? And this is something that um, Tobias, I think, has tried to um, uh, demonstrate to us. How do they relate to other document types, be it images, uh, film images in various other archival repositories, as in Lindsay's presentation uh, and in Chris's presentation, or as Ingo demonstrated to other types of archival documents? How can they be mapped to geographic space and tangible objects? A question that is inseparable from all of the discourses of digital humanities, uh, geotagging, mapping, etc. And how can we reach a media literate understanding of moving images and their impact, which I think touches upon core questions of ethics, um, of museum ethics too, and also, um, as I come from a memory uh, institution and museum background, to questions of education, outreach, and um, digital literacy. Last but not least, how can we engage with complex history through digital tools? And um, the Holocaust and its problematic visual history might just be, I, I'd say, uh, the most difficult um, proof of concept of those technologies. So, um, why these objectives? So again, going back to the background that we all um, move in as researchers and as people working in heritage institutions. Um, digitization often is still one dimensional, a snapshot in time of objects. Those digital collections are hard to discover. And I think Lindsay's, uh, Lindsay demonstrated it to us that even looking at shots of the Dachau, so-called uh, death trains, we do actually have to cross several institutional borders and actually search across, even in the United States of America and for American footage, look uh, across a variety of different institutions. However, um, we are talking about this on a global scale, so including the Soviet Union footage, for instance, including films produced and then used by European institutions broadens the scope and also complicates the matter. They are threatened by obsolescence, and I don't have to dwell on this, but the preservation of digital assets of digitization performed in the course of the last 20 years is one of the main issues now for heritage institutions. There is a need for us all to present cultural heritage in attractive and innovative ways. I'm not going to dwell on that, but we all know that uh, just making it available alone um, doesn't work, particularly for um, for younger generations and particularly in a digital ecosystem where we are all competing for attention. And heritage needs to be dynamic and open for reuse, which um, again, in a European context is very different than in a US American context, just um, talking about public domain, for instance. Um, summarizing a need to connect the tangible and the intangible, the physical and the digital domains. This touches upon the questions that memorials face nowadays how can the physical experience of being in a place and connecting to heritage, commemoration, find um, an equivalent or connect to or get into a dialogue with the virtual, so with added resources, digital resources. 
Well, and then came um, 2020 and um, in a way the COVID pandemic, and I don't want to tell you all about um, the disruptions it caused for uh, science and for archival access, but it also taught us lessons pertaining to the objectives of um, our research projects. And I'm going to just quickly go through some of them. Memory institutions struggled to go digital. So in a way, the pressing issue that we as archives, libraries, galleries, museums need to, um, in a way, reinvent ourselves and um, constitute our digital selves came under a lot of press pressure. We also realized as not-for-profit institutions and public institutions that we are in a competitive disadvantage that um, is uh, just for myself as a film heritage institution, for instance, competing on the level of digital streaming and the accessibility and discoverability of our holdings with giants such as YouTube, for instance, or even Netflix or Amazon is absolutely impossible. Um, the power of digital information and misinformation. So in our original project uh, proposal, we actually talked about the necessity to create resources on the visual history of the Holocaust, the liberation of the concentration camps that are authoritative, that are trusted resources. And I think all of the events um, of the past two years um, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, um, as well as in the United States and in the UK, have uh, taught us a lot about the power of digital information and misinformation, um, about alternative facts, uh, deep fakes, or the social media culture of intense personalization and use of fragmentation. So information that is contained in ideological bubbles or echo chambers where misinformation and distorted histories are actually amplified and further disseminated. All of this um, actually marked the significance of what theoreticians call the age of the user, where authority shifts to the individual at the crossroads of several platforms versus traditional models of authority and of expertise. So what does that do to Holocaust, um, to the um, dissemination of knowledge about Holocaust history and archival resources? We believe that a digital platform needs to answer to that. Um, digital hesitancy uh, has effects on democratic participation and social well-being, saying that um, many institutions have waited for too long to digitize, to ensure that their digital assets are actually useful and to connect their digital assets. So, so one of the things that um, I personally find enormously gratifying professionally and personally in this project is that for the first time now, we as a European research institutions have been able to actually reach out to our partners and friends in the United States, as well as in the UK and in the former Soviet Union republics to ensure that these precious and important filmic materials and non-filmic materials can actually be digitized and that the digital items can be aggregated and brought together. Our hesitancy to do so is baffling if you look at the scope and the importance of the Holocaust for contemporary history, identity and audiovisual culture, but it hasn't been done before. And last but not least, um, shared historical experiences matter and they beget new ways of um, storytelling. So I think uh, one of the positive aspects of the pandemic was that it has been a powerful reminder of the power of a shared historical experience. The pandemic encouraged us to seek new and hybrid ways of integrating digital into our physical lives and, for instance, push the ideas of digital journalism and digital humanities, the visualization and augmentation of data and the sharing and creation of communities to new levels. So there is actually a positive aspect um, to um, what I said earlier about um, digital culture. So the challenge of a project such as ours is to leverage these challenges and opportunities and to ensure that our learnings, the solutions, technical or methodological that we find, contributes to creating best practice models for digital engagement with the Holocaust as well as in other contexts. And so um, the conclusions we came to are, um, and bear with me for another three short points, um, Digital curation of cultural heritage is crucial to combat misinformation and extremism. It is crucial to encourage critical thinking 
and thereby also to safeguard democracy and allow high level participation. So strengthen civic engagement with history through digital curation is one of those objectives that we, um, conclusions we arrived at. Then um, enabling the sharing of cultural heritage, such as the liberation footage and the related documentation through digitization and aggregation of digital infrastructures. So breaking up the compartmentalized structure, for instance, of European cultural heritage, but also reaching um, across the Atlantic and ensure that our assets and the information of it are actually aggregated, that we speak common languages of making them interoperable. And last but not least, support advanced digitization of cultural heritage. It is one of those points you always believe are moot points at this stage. Hasn't everything been digitized? Is it now only about connecting the dots? Uh, no, it certainly is not. Uh, as we've learned, and Chris talked about it earlier, as we've painfully learned in the last years, um, our digitization pipelines are fragile. They are prone to disruption and not everything is digitized. And um, we need to support strategies that allow that digitization can continue and the digitization is undertaken in a sustainable matter. Much more about this can be found on the project website and in our deliverables. So thank you for your attention. And um, I'm heading back to uh, Sema. Sema, if you want to have any last comments um, before we dive into the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I just, no, not, not too many. I just wanted to um, just say, some organizational things about the project. So it's um, funded by the uh, Horizon 2020 program of the uh, European Union, which is, um, and the project, uh, project duration is up until uh, the end of next year. So it's a four, it has been or is a four year project. Um, and uh, it is, it is led by a consortium um, of a multinational group really um, of Austrian, German, French and Israeli research institutions. So uh, uh, we, we also partner with um, memorial sites and um, technolog uh, technology developers and um, we have associated partners in Germany, the Fritz Bauer Institute and two United States institutions uh, which is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and uh, NARA. And the content providers are from, um, besides the US, uh, from the UK, Russia, and all other former Soviet republics. So yeah, just to have an idea about how this project is being done. Well, um, this is it for the presentations and the speakers. Um, the floor is open for discussion. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to just add something from the speakers. If they have missed something that they wanted to say. I would just like to say that, um, you know, I, I'm concerned about, um, you know, how you guys handle this stuff. I mean, you're looking at these, these awful, awful photographs and images and films every single day. And, you know, thank you for doing that. I mean, the fact that you guys are bringing this stuff to light, making it accessible, uh, making it available to uh, educators such as myself, um, I, I really thank you so so much for that. But how do you protect your own mental health when you when you do this every single day? When you're looking at these images, when you're when you're you're going through this stuff, and you know the you see the images of this this horrific suffering, um, there's got to be some kind of a component to that as well. Michael, would you like to answer um, that? Well, look, um, uh, pro Lindsay is probably the one, Lindsay and Chris have, have really been at, at, at the cold face of this um, for, for, for a lot of it. I, I'm, I might just briefly say in, in terms of um, my, myself, um, it, it, it helps to be a film historian insofar that there's always, if you want an abstraction layer that you automatically like think about things like filmic technique, you think about um, how reality is basically about the construction of reality in a medium and thereby you cushion some of the blow, but it has been an issue for my staff, for instance. So just to, to um, 
and we, for instance, it's, it's something that um, Ingo Zechner, Sema and I discussed in the management office that we also provide for um, counseling for staff and that there is actually trained psychiatrists and psychologists on standby who work with uh, survivors and people who have experienced extreme violence or intergenerational um, trauma where inter intergenerational trauma is an issue. So far, um, none of my staff um, have taken up the offer. One of our archivists who actually reviews every single frame of this has helped himself by reading the poetry of Primo Levi and actually saying that basically the, the, the word itself is so powerful and the horror conveyed in the words helps him to actually um, put into perspective um, the sometimes calls it the brutal banality of the images. And um, he says, well, um, it is all about actually us being aware of what a responsibility we have as archivists, isn't it? So that's what keeps him motivated. But that's, that's one individual story uh, of one individual there. I don't know, Lindsay, um, Chris, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your question. Having done this for over 20 years, it um, it's not easy and it's as uh, Michael uh, referenced, I think sometimes uh, it's it becomes more difficult when you're when you're working with people who are who are new to this content um, to try to uh, <clears throat> empathize with with where they're at in watching images like this for the very first time. And I'm hyper aware of that when I make um, presentations, especially. Uh, um, but, you know, personally, uh, I think um, we probably all have our coping mechanisms for handling the content. And I think um, knowing at the end of the day that, uh, you know, preserving these materials is really the core, the importance here is to preserve them and to make them accessible so that hopefully uh, we can, um, we can avoid this kind of horror in the future. Um, so that that's kind of keeps me uh, keeps me at it. And if there is a, you know, a really tough day or I'm feeling particularly vulnerable, um, I try to remind myself that it's, you know, 2021 and I can uh, walk outside and appreciate the uh, nature environment and uh, the people with whom um, I'm working, especially on this project. We're all kind of in this together. And I think we know we can always phone one another um, to talk through some difficult moments. I hope that uh, helps. I'm not sure if Chris wants to uh, jump in. I definitely agree with uh, all of Lindsay's points, especially when you bring new staff on, or even, you know, my staff have been with me for 15 years now. And I have actually, and I will enforce a rule that basically says, as soon as you have scanned a reel. I need you to get up and move around and, you know, not just plow through this. Um, and from the digitization perspective, I will say that perhaps in some ways, even though we're sitting in front of the content as it's being scanned, one of the things we can do is look away and look at all of the technical parameters. So we make sure that, you know, everything is within scope and things are being scanned correctly, but we don't necessarily have to gaze directly at the images. Um, if there is a particularly rough patch. Um, I think for me, in some cases, the thing that becomes scariest is um, having done this both at the start of my career at NARA when we were preparing for the uh, at that point, 60th anniversary. Um, I found myself becoming desensitized to the images, which I found actually more problematic in many ways than um, in some ways, the trauma behind them. And I feel like that's almost a, a scarier, a scarier thing. So I also have to, on the flip side, remind myself that like, you know, this isn't, you know, horror like you would have seen on Game of Thrones, you know, it's, um, it's a real event and it's very impactful. And, you know, as tough as it can be in either of those situations, I feel really honored to do this work. And, uh, you know, all of us are public servants for, for a reason. And, you know, this is imperative that it is preserved and digitized and made accessible. 
I think Todd Shore would like to have a comment on that. <laughs> um, sure. Can you hear me and see me? You can see me and hear me? See, yes, now. Okay, excellent. Um, I, I really wasn't. I was just making a comment on that. That uh, yeah, I, I've been doing Holocaust stuff for about a decade, and before that, I was doing um, white power movement stuff, and so that was you know daily reading Horus, Horus <laughs> um, ideas and imagery, and definitely um, as I said in the question answer, there's a lot of compartmentalization that occurs. Um, that you're kind of looking at this as an as a researcher and academic. Um, but also, uh, I, I do worry about that desensitization. And it's one of the things that I go over with my class. Um, I teach a hate groups class for a couple of decades, and I have them go and look at their data and learn from the people from primary documents and things. And um, we talk about it, you know, how they see these, that the, they see themselves even becoming desensitized just in the span of a semester to these messages. And then I ask them, you know, well, what do you think it is like for me? <laughs> but on the other hand, um, sometimes it just comes crashing down. Um, and actually, today was one of them. I've seen the videos before um, of the, the the trains, um, the death trains. But um, it looked to me like there was a, a couple here that was crying while they were watching it, and that that really kind of broke it down to me that this is so real. And I'm sorry, I'm way off camera. I didn't expect to be on camera. Um, and so it, it does happen, though, definitely. Um, but it is it's it's difficult to deal with this um, both ways. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's um, a good way, but uh, probably some of the speakers would like to talk about the curatorial approach to this question, like how we will deal with the images and the connections um, uh, to, to the different kind of materials. Um, also, uh, having in mind this question of what it makes for the viewer. Yes, to be is. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think this is really a crucial question. Um, and uh, I'm very, yeah, it's, it's great to hear your um, your thoughts on that, also from my fellow presenters. Uh, I think that's actually an important aspect. What are potential coping strategies that refer to the way how we are not just looking at such footage but doing something with it i think one of the problems is of course that these images are out there they are streamed all the time they are circulating and they are often put out of context or they are put just into this kind of context of shocking and from my experience it is already this approach of trying to explore what is behind these images trying to explore the stories of the people who took them, trying to understand the reactions, getting also the power to understand how they shaped visual memory by being able really to understand the ways these images were migrating through our culture, um, creates a certain form of empowerment, which I think is important also for educational approaches towards Holocaust history but also to the way how we can then creatively or co-creatively deal with it. Uh, and this does not only mean by making new films or turning this into art, but also in the way of how research is designed and how research is really kind of getting into a dialogue with such images. But, and this, this includes also to understand where is a certain um, boundary and where is it also sometimes not necessary to repeat and to review the, the actual footage um, because it is already part of our um, our collective memory and i want to em emphasize that one of the aspects which i like very much about our project is that on the one hand we we are getting closer and better a better understanding of of the most iconic footage which offers also certain distance to their emotional impact but on the other hand, we also see what what other images and what other footage was taken by the cameramen, which which then was often not used and reused in the films. And I found particularly striking. We don't have evidence yet, and maybe maybe Lindsay and Chris, you know much more of the footage. 
where we have other impressions. But what I found quite interesting is that what circulated was mainly the shocking footage and the dead bodies. But we see a lot of encounters with the living, with the survivors, with the, with the attempts to get back to life in the camps. Um, uh, 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 when we are looking at the footage which was not used and which were actually the outtakes of the films. Are there any more questions? I, I actually have uh, one, one more question. So um, we, we've got all this footage, all this this material. Do we have any idea what percentage this is of the actual material that was that was created? I mean, I mean, well, obviously, what we have is is horrible and graphic enough, and we certainly can learn from that. But is do we have any idea of, of how much of it's still out there, or how much of it was created that we we weren't able to to collect or capture? Ingo, do you want to re reply to that? So we are in, within this project, we are actually trying to identify all the material and to get hold of uh, as much as possible, meaning to digitize or even re-digitize if necessary. And uh, this was, uh, yeah, uh, or still is one of the big challenges of the project, uh, taking into consideration the COVID-19 impact in addition with archives closed and so on. Uh, but still, I think, uh, at the end of the project, we will have uh, a pretty good idea of what was uh, produced and what we were able uh, to to digitize and make available, but still out there. And uh, there will be material that we won't be able to digitize. That's for sure. And I, I think in terms of the in terms of the American material, um, Ingo, Lindsay, Chris, um, I th I think we've got a pretty good understanding by now of what is actually there, and we will be able to pretty precisely tell what we've how much of that we have actually been able to make accessible. Correct? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. That there's a, it's very different. If I may very briefly um, add to that, it is um, for the British material similar situation there's much less material and we have a pretty good understanding and are confident that everything that is actually really relevant and with a few exceptions for issues of copyright um, we will be able to access um, the big unknown quantities is still the ex-soviet material so the perspective if you want the other perspective and the other iconography um, where there is a wealth of materials and we are only now getting to um, identify, I'd say like about 20 hours worth of material that we are, where we hope that we will be acquire, to be able to acquire about 50 to 65, 70% of that. But um, it is a very, very different culture of archives and a very, very different methodology of uh, actually classifying the footage. And some of the material looks entirely different because the yeah. Soviets started as early as 1941, 1942 to capture atrocities on film. And it's mainly not about concentration camps, but yeah. about shootings, mass graves and others. So the Holocaust looks very different from that perspective. And that's also part of what we are trying to study how a certain um, visualization of the Holocaust uh, was possible based on films and photographs that may have been quite different if the Soviet material was circulated in uh, on a wider scale. Uh, I just wanted right. to, to jump in. I, I know there's a question. I just did want to say that um, in response to this question that uh, we are still uh, acquiring private collections and uncovering new uh, angles. So these materials are being um, discovered and donated for example, to the Holocaust Museum, even during the past few months of the of the pandemic. So there are shots and sort of new angles that I think we will never know how much was covered. And I don't think we'll ever get a sense of everything that did exist if it still exists. Um, um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to reference that. And I think Arthur has a question. Uh, would you would you like to ask a final question, Arthur Soshtak? Is that because you raised your hand? 
Um, oh. I think you need to unmute. Arthur, you need to unmute, please. He's not muted, technically. No, he's not anymore, but he, yeah. Arthur, we can't hear you. You want to, you can type your question in the Q&A instead, if you like. So, you're actually running out of time. Yes, we're, at, we're, we're about at the end of our time. I'm going to, you know, thanks so and much. need to hand over to Jeffrey to run <laughs> for the well, well, what a, what a fantastic panel. Um, you know, the work you guys are doing is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Um, I'll never look at a picture the same way again, any picture, um, let alone the ones that, that you guys are going through. Um, there is a networking lunch. I just want to let everyone know that uh, we'll be open from 12 to 1230. And uh, uh, that'll be every day of the conference. You can find this in the agenda within the lobby or click uh, on the networking icon on the left hand column of the lobby page. Uh, this little feature uh, will pair. This feature will pair uh, those who participate with one other person for a short networking opportunity, about five minutes or so, uh, and they will potentially um, get to meet a total of six people within the uh, the thirty minutes. We hope that you will attend also this afternoon uh, some of our sessions. Those are happening at one o'clock on the main stage. We have uh, myths and realities of American responses to the Holocaust, nineteen thirty eight to nineteen forty five. And in a breakout session, we will have um, American responses um, and we'll have folks with the USHMM resources and the JDC archives. This evening at seven o'clock, uh, we hope you will join us for Soul Witness, a film screening of questions and answers with the director, um, R. Harvey Bradman. So we've got a lot of um, programming this week and we hope you'll join us for as much of it as you as you can thank you for being with us thank you to our panelists thank you for sema for for moderating and we'll see you again um, at one of the other sessions bye bye <laughs>